Good morning to everyone and thank you for connecting to us on this hottest day of the year, I believe. This is the Erwin Mitchin session on making decisions under pressure. Today is about connecting with our clients, our communities and our colleagues, but it's also about celebrating Armed Forces Day. It's this coming weekend and we should have been in Scarborough with Commodore, Waterhouse and all the crew, but instead we're hosting a series of virtual events to celebrate the work of the armed forces. And that really is what today is all about. Just a few housekeeping points. I'm not expecting any fire drills, but you will have the ability to put questions in and we really want to hear from you. There's going to be quite a large chunk of today devoted to your questions. So you'll be able to submit that um, through the usual uh, way. And I know that there are quite a few delegates who have some connection to the Kajaki Dam incident. So we'd obviously like to hear from you as well. We'll be recording the event and we'll send it out to you um, afterwards. So in terms of introductions, I'm Geraldine McCool. I've been uh, working for service personnel in claims against the Ministry of Defence, I'm afraid, since 1990. I know, I don't look that old. I specialise in military aviation crashes and I've done that since um, Chinook Bill of Kintyre, I'm trying to remember when that was, a long time ago, 1994. I'm also Vice Chairman of the Royal British Legion Solicitors Group. I also do inquests, including those for free. Um, I did Sergeant Steve Roberts, the first soldier to die in Iraq, that was a body armour point, and also Corporal of the Horse Matty Hull, and that was a 10 friendly fire. I had a team here at Owen Mitchell who act for about 650 service personnel and their families. And we really uh, want to be part of Armed Forces Day. We have signed the Armed Forces Covenant and we're the largest law firm to get the ERS Silver Award. So we're very proud of that work. And it's my absolute privilege to work alongside today with Anne Divalo, that George Medal holder. Now I've known Andy for 12 years and the Kajaki Dam incident that we're going to speak about took place before that on the 6th of September 2006. The events were made into a film, uh, Kajaki in this country, Kila to Bravo, I believe, uh, in the United States. And that's currently streaming on Netflix. I know Mitchell supported the launch, DVD launch, at the Imperial War Museum. Now, Paul Catis of Pucker Film Productions, when he was looking for the subject matter of the film, he looked through lots of incident reports from Iraq and Afghanistan, and these are known as Board of Inquiries. And he picked on this incident for um, reasons that will become clear uh, if you do see the film. Sadly, Corporal Mark Wright, who was awarded the George Cross posthumously, died in the minefield and six of Andy's colleagues were seriously wounded. Andy suffered the loss of a leg, as did two other of his colleagues. Andy and I met at the inquest in October 2008 in Oxford, um, alongside Mark's parents, Bob and Jem Wright, who I remember today. And the coroner praised Andy and his colleagues for being courageous and utterly fearless. Now, today isn't about mistakes that were made that were referred to in the Board of Inquiry and Inquest. It's nothing to do with that. Lessons have been learned. It is, as I say, about talking about what the armed forces do, and in particular, making decisions under pressure. Andy's been a client, he's also been ambassador for my military team. We've done many events uh, together. He supported our Don't Quit Do It uh, campaign for uh, disabled sport. And he's now a welfare officer with Blesma. As Andy says, giving back to the community. And I know he wants to talk um, about that as well. 
And basically at the beginning of lockdown, Andy rang me and said, look, what can I do for Owen Mitchell? There he was, giving back again. And today is all about what he can do. So I'm very pleased now to introduce the trailer to the film. But just before we do, if you do watch the film, this is a housekeeping point. Andy's Ken. I went to the red carpet premiere in Leicester Square, I took the defence correspondent of the Sunday Times as my guest, and I'm sitting muttering, saying, there's no Ken, there's no Ken. And he had to point out that that might be the nickname of Andy Barlow. So just look out for that if you watch the film. And here's the trailer. One here, boy. Two boy, bravo. Main strike. Man down, mate. Zero two, bravo. Come in. This is it for Jackie Dam. What it's all about. That's a water. Got burn pit. It's about 16 odd here at Athens. Seven, eight up at Normandy. And your mum looks hotter every month. <laughs> Taking eight up here. A few Chinese rockets, bit of boom boom in the valley. Well, that's it. Look, it's right of ammo. All right, ladies. Radio check at the bottom. I'll see you when you get back. Stay on mark tracks. You, Chris, come on, man. We've got a man down. No, please just charge me. We're going nowhere. Moving impossible due to location being minefield. Get him out of here! You do not let that man drop! Dude, come on, man! Get your ass over here! You're not dying today, yeah? What do you? What do you? He's gonna set off another. Hey, do it! Just sit tight, alright? We're gonna get you out here. So there we have a flavour um, of the trailer um, and uh, Ken known as Andy or Andy known as Ken was uh, the um, soldier shouting um, what do I do in that particular uh, scene. So don't forget to submit the questions. I'm just going to run through a few for Andy now, um, but really want to hear from you with things you want to know about. So Andy, let's remind ourselves that you were 19 when you found yourself in that minefield in Kajaki. I'm going to ask a very loyally cross-examination um, about how well you remember those uh, events now, but also about how you think your military training prepared you for the decisions that you had to make on the day. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I was young, and although being in, based in Northern Ireland for a short time, um, you know, I was I was still very new to the army. But on the day, the decisions had to be made quite rationally. Um, and what I've learned since um, has been phenomenal. So being in that experience, but at 19, when you're used to people telling you what to do. And obviously in, in the scene in the film there, you saw that I was on my own and asking what do I do? What do I do? Was kind of realistic at the time because I was on my own with um, two casualties with severe injuries. And I think the guidance from Tug was brilliant. So me shouting across and him helping with the feedback and helping what to do was great. But the training side of life, I'll admit it and I've admitted it in every one of my talks since, you know, I was flapping at that time and I, I admit it um, to this day because I was out of my comfort zone. And comfort zones you don't realize until you're in a really severe situation but after about five or ten minutes and starting to get along with it that's when my training did click in and suddenly you start to you know you come back to life and you start to put on a case on you start to chest seal people so your mind takes you back to that first aid training whether it's you know for a for a small injury or a catastrophic injury and again the guidance with the medics in the minefield at the time although they were 15 meters away shouting what to do really helped because you're being severely tested there. And as you say that 
all the training in the world, all the best military training, it can't replicate the actual situation. So I think there's always acknowledgement of that. Now, you mentioned Tug Hartley there giving you the commands. Earlier, Mark, who I see um, you have in the background there, uh, was giving commands as, as the leader. The coroner referred to his unhesitating courage in what were desperate um, circumstances. Um, how was your training geared to following those commands or were you trained to also question them as well? Um, there was no questioning from me and the reason for that was you know I was I was new the, the people around me especially Mark um, and Stu's and everybody else in the minefield you know they they had a lot more experience and it's quite, it's quite strange because Mark's my age now you know my age now at 34 Mark was um, uh, was within the same year and it's it's really hard for me to talk about that because Mark was Mark saved my life. If Mark wasn't where he was when the Chinook mine went off, I wouldn't be here. You know, we were two foot apart um, and Mark took that blast for me. So, you know, with, with regards to the to the taking commands wise, I was doing what I was told because it was one. That's what I was trained to do at my rank at the time. And two, you know, I had to put faith in others and trust. And I think even though we hadn't known each other for that long, you know, we were two separate units. There was three para elements and fusilier elements, which was my background. So it was quite, um, it was quite nice, even in that situation that, you know, there was no, there was no competitiveness. It was just, we're all here together. We're all going to work as a team and um, we followed orders as best we can. Yeah, that's great, because I did want to ask you about the teamwork. I, I watched the film uh, again last Sunday and that it really became clear to me that you've got Mark and then you've got Tug. You, you've got to all work together and you can suddenly find yourself being the leader when you hadn't previously been. Um, there's a lot of comms going on, um, uh, a lot of <laughs> gallows humour, a lot of swearing as well uh, for, for anybody in the film. Of course, that's entirely realistic. Um, but how important are those comms in, in the teamwork in such a, a really difficult environment? So communication saves lives. That's probably one of the biggest key skills that I've learned over the last um, you know, 15 years since that since that incident and yeah with, without a doubt communication is the key and I think even even going into the film there's a point where it was it was um, Dave's birthday and it was true so everything that you do see in the film is is 99% true um, there's, there's one small part which I won't go into um, which is fine it's just to made for more dramatic effect uh, but yeah there's even the medics singing happy birthday and getting everybody to sing happy birthday there was a there was a key skill behind that and that was to check everybody's observations which now thinking back i think that's phenomenal you know it wasn't just to to sing happy birthday to somebody in the worst day possible it was purely to the medic's point of view to check everybody's observations um so yeah definitely communications does does save lives because um Tuck hartley was the one with the medical um training and um uh, of course medics uh, and the um of course, the Royal Army Medical Corps often find themselves um, having to make decisions um, uh, on this. I mean, what level of, of training did Turk have? Because he found himself really there, didn't he, trying to help people. Um, it must have been just very difficult because for all of you, um, you all have basic training. We can see that administrating. What were the decisions that you had to make sort of medically, if you like? Um, Tug, Tug was... A combat medic so he was trained to deal you know more or less uh, para, uh, paramedic level yeah so you know so he, he had a lot of um of skills there but i think even in the tours before it I, i'm not sure and i don't want to quote tug but i think he'd, he'd been in um not a severe incidents but but you know had had some um experience beforehand with with a few casualties but you know him and Alex Craig both of them together yeah. just worked as a team and they were really good at delegating as well whether it was to me to give morphine to Stu or to Tourniquet Mark or to Chess Seal you know they knew what they were doing um, and again I'm not saying they were in the most comfortable position but it just proves that what they'd gone through in their training was um, perceived in the minefield. Yeah now Andy you mentioned um, that lots of your colleagues that day um, such as Stu Pearson who is another 
great friend of Owen Mitchell, um, were paras, but you were a fusilier. And uh, I know you and I last year were at a tower dinner uh, by Owen Mitchell when we heard Major General Paul Nansen speak. He's um, the uh, army leadership guru and recently retired as commandant of, of Sandhurst. Um, he's written um, the book Stand Up Straight. And I, I had a look at that um, about decision making. Um, and he sets out seven steps uh, on that. And the first two steps are what is the situation and how does it affect me? And I'll only read out the two. And the second one is what have I been told to do and why? But really the, the point of this is that um, Paul says it's not a checklist. It's absolutely an overall analytical um, approach. So you've got that kind of approach and then you've got instinct. Do you think in decision making there is room for both? What, what do you think about that sort of um, analytical approach to things in training? I think there's definitely two approaches um, and probably more. You know, you can you can look at something and decide, well, could this work? You know, there may be one or two options. Whereas I think when you're in a in a situation like we were in Kajeki, there, there was no time to think, you know, things had to be done there and then. Um, and I suppose, although some of the decisions could have been rash, I, I believe they were all correct on the day, which is, which apart from the, apart from the chin up, but again, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, and, and sometimes, of course, that's when the, the training, the instinct kicks in. It feels instinctive, but actually, it's only instinctive because it, you've been trained in that. Um, you may not realise uh, that. Now, I, I understand uh, that. What, sort of looking back now, the decisions that you made on the day, um, how do you think they have affected you in later life? What have you learned from those? Um, a lot. <laughs> I think going, co coming through that, coming out the other side just gave me a, a, a sense of life. You know, Mark not being here. I, I took quite hard at first um, because he did save my life. If he wasn't where he was, I, I, I guarantee I wouldn't be here today because the blast would have hit me. But I think I think decisions going forward. I kind of have a four step approach, um, but I want to talk about the fourth one. The first one is kind of, you know, it's a rash decision. So it doesn't need to be done now. Not not much thinking involved and kind of do it. And it's either a successful outcome or a failure. Um, but again, failures can be good in some ways because we learn. Um, the second step approach I have is called the red approach or the red wine approach. And I think that's where you can sit down with a nice glass of red wine and, and think about things, discuss it um, and then again, come up with an outcome and it's nine times out of ten going to be successful. And then the third approach is the whiskey approach, which is the really harsh decision making where you've been taken by Strand and then obviously from there you um, you come up with a good solution between um, a group around the table and things get done. So that's kind of my, my three step approach. It's um, not published in, in Major General Nansen's book, but it's um, it certainly works in, in my world. Um, now, I should say Andy looks very still at the moment and very calm. Uh, that's because I think the, the frame is frozen. I do apologise to all our uh, viewers for that. I think we can hear um, Andy uh, loud and clear. Some might say it'd be better not to see him at all, frankly, but um, hopefully that will be rectified. But uh, meanwhile, um, uh, obviously we can hear Andy, so I will continue with the questions. But um, please do submit the uh, questions through the uh, live event uh, Q&A because I'd love to come on to those um, uh, as we get um, going. Um, and I want to ask you in your, you've talked about your four step um, approach, how far do you think you should take into account how your decisions are going to adversely affect others because often in the decision making process there will be some winners and there will be some losers is that a hard part of the process um, i think you're always going to get winners and losers and success and failure and angry success but like i say as long as the, the way i look at it with with decision making and what i've learned so far is 
you know, if, if there is a hiccup or a failure, it's how you learn from it. And that's the most positive key skill. It's overcoming that, that scenario, being able to analyze it. Um, and that's kind of what I learned from Kajaki and Tuck into elite sport. So within skiing, um, you know, when, when you're going down a ski course at between 60 to 80 miles an hour, you've got to turn where somebody else makes you turn because they put gates in front of you. So even though you'll get one run before it, which you can't race down, you get one run to analyze that track. It, it's what you take from that and learn the points of, right, okay, I can be fluid here, but actually that turn at gate number 12 is a steep right turn. So I've got to put more pressure on there. And you've got to do this, at, you know, within milliseconds. So it's quite, it's quite fast thinking, but again, it works. Um, and sometimes it works and you finish and sometimes you don't, you know, but again, it's the more, it's taking failure on the head and realizing why you failed, what can be done and what's going to make it a success next time. So you mentioned this, the skiing there. I've seen um, photographs of this, Andy, obviously I've uh, followed your um, uh, career. Um, as someone who comes down a green slope, um, the slowest it is possible um, to to do. I cannot imagine um, uh, skiing at, at any speed. Uh, it's not something I enjoy. What what attracted you? Because you didn't ski before uh, the incident. What what um, made you go down the skiing route? So I was headhunted in two thousand and eight uh, to participate in one of the first tri-service um, disabled sport programs that the forces have put on and it, it worked really well. So it was the, it was the, it was before battle back. It was just after help heroes and it was kind of a let's run an exercise in Germany um, and get disabled soldiers skiing next to able-bodied soldiers. They will do exactly the same classroom work. They'll be on the slopes together and it, and it worked. And I was fortunate to be part of that, that first one. And even on day one, luckily, I don't know whether it's because I'm six foot three um, or just stupid. Uh, one of the coaches at the time said, you know what, you've got potential. And that kind of led me into a decision to go back to sailing. So I didn't ski for four years after. Um, and then I, I don't know, I just clicked to my head and said, you know what, let's give it a go. Um, and within two years, I've made World Cup, which was amazing. Um, and it's, it's changed my life because it's given me another key skill where my disability, which I don't see as a disability, um, I can I can lead an independent life. You know, whether I'm on a ski slope with one leg or two legs, it doesn't matter. I'm I'm there. It's it's my own environment, and it's the freedom to to go and do what I enjoy. And how have you been in that new sport? How have you been uh, helped by coaches and and mentors? So what I'm thinking about there is you have the military and you have the training. Um, how much is your own training uh, in the skiing uh, and how much did you have help there? Yes, yeah, so um, my mentors, I had one senior mentor, which was General Sir Peter Wall, and he he um, changed the way I look at my civilian life. And I'll, I'll come on to that in a, in a minute. But skiing wise, my mentor was one of my best friends and he was a SART major in the engineers. Um, and we just created a relationship together that enabled us to to go and win and do well um especially in the british championships which i was quite proud of it, it was we kind of wrote the book from military skiing through to um paralympic skiing and the reasons for that are the majority of people on the ski circuit in disability sports have started at birth obviously my injury happened at 19 so i didn't have the privilege or the upbringing to be able to ski or sail at a younger age. So I had to learn at the age of 25 when I learned to ski um, to compete with a 16 year old kid going down a slope very fast. So again, I had to I had to evolve 12 years skiing within four, which was the Paralympic cycle. Um, so we had to, you know, we were in the gym working harder than, than most people at that time. Um, and we had to really look at skiers from able-bodied and disabled skiers and kind of learn visually and I know that I'm a visual learner um, you can give me a buck and I'll throw it out a window but yeah learning visually is my key skill and I think from watching people it just gave me that set of um, this is what we want to do and this is how we're going to achieve it. Yeah. And you've spoken about sailing as well again I know something that you hadn't done um, beforehand uh, and again a very challenging what we're talking transatlantic uh, 
sailing, um, not down the Mere and Tatton Park, which is all I've ever done. Um, why sailing? Um, it was a phone call from, from a friend of mine who worked at the RV uh, the Infantry Sailing Centre at the time, who said, Do you fancy coming down to, to a boat? Um, and I went and I fell in love with the sport and I kind of moved down to Portsmouth and yeah, became a yacht master within three years and, and was then taking able-bodied soldiers and started up taking out disabled soldiers sailing. So it was quite, it was quite nice because I was then in a position where I was in charge of, you know, various amounts of, of equipment, a, a £150,000 yacht and seven lives at sea. And is there any examples uh, in terms of skiing or sailing um, where you've had to make decisions under pressure? Yes, it was at the top of a downhill in Meribel um, and the weather was really bad. So it was, it was snowing quite heavily. And I remember the two forerunners who went before me. So a forerunner is somebody that checks the, the course is safe for everybody to run. Uh, one of them was helicoptered off with a broken leg and I had to make the decision, I'm first. So do I go or not? And I looked behind me and I had the, the army ski team, so all, all my friends and the RAF and the Navy ski teams, both male and female, there's about 40 of us. And I had to make the decision to go. Uh, and the reason being, everybody that knew me from skiing knew that I was the one that would go down a mountain at stupid speed and be quite happy. And although I was out of my comfort zone, I, I had to do it because they wouldn't have gone and they would have started questioning, well, why is Andy not going? So I kind of went, what they didn't see is after I'd done two turns and I was out of their view, I kind of slowed down um, and then got to the bottom. But it was that that was one of the ones in skiing where I had to think about everybody else and think, do you know, if I don't go, people are going to question it and it's not fair. Um, so I went. And Andy, just before turning to the questions um, that we have, uh, just a, a couple of things. We have some um, cadets who um, are viewing this webinar uh, today. Um, what advice would you give to them? They're considering obviously careers uh, uh, in the military. Don't do it. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I believe that you know, the military changed my life um, and I won't go into too much detail, but I, I joined the army at 16 straight out of school because I was, I was probably going to end up in prison. Uh, my upbringing in a council estate in Bolton, the poshest place in the north, um, wasn't wasn't the best. And I think the army changed my life. Um, it turned me into who I am today, and it gave me the friends that I've got today. You know, I remember going back home from school, uh, from training at 16, 17 years old, with some money in my pocket, and my friends from back home who I'd grown up with at school were either again going to prison, um, involved with some some serious crimes or just just not working and had no money. So I think it's definitely worth the career, even if you stay in for four years, um, it, it's a good life and it's a good way of getting a trade. You know, the infantry is great, but I think if you've got the key skills to go forward, whether you become an officer um, or go and get a trade, whether it's the engineers, the REME, the RLC, wherever, um, there's, there's great career options after, especially in transition. Okay. Um, and then just wanted, before we do take the questions, to you to talk a little bit about your work now as a welfare officer with with Blesma. Uh, and I know the particular challenges of, of lockdown and, and the virtual uh, world. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yep, so um, I'm very privileged. I currently work for Blesma, which used to stand for the British Limitless Tech Servicemen's Association. It's now just Blesma. The limbless veterans because we've got male female veterans and we also cater for loss of use of limb um, hearing and sight loss what I, what I want to it's great to, to make awareness on this which is part of my job um, one of the one of the main things that I get out of Blesmer is one we haven't heard of you or two how do I become a member um, Blesmer's policy is the same as the as the veteran armed forces covenant policy so if you've served for one day um, then and you lose your limb or lose your loss of limb through trauma, then you're able to become a member. And I know there's lots of, of the army elements that I go and deliver talks to that haven't heard of Blesma or don't. And to be fair, when I was injured, I didn't hear of them. Um, I met them in hospital, which is where we still meet people. Um, but it's just a, it's a it's an amazing organisation. And I don't say that because I work for them. 
Um, it is an amazing organisation that does lead limbless veterans and their families to, to fulfil and live independent lives. And during uh, lockdown, I think you've you've uh, pioneered some ways of, of communicating yourself with your members. Yeah, so I've spent the last eight weeks um, trying to get people on Zoom to create virtual coffee mornings. So because a lot of my members are vulnerable and I cater for 375 members in the South and their families and the majority are in the vulnerable category. So we had to come up with with events without actually going out to um, break isolation and Zoom and Teams have been fantastic. I've had uh, soldiers from 30 years old all the way through to 85 year old World War II veterans or um, and their families that have got together on Zoom and in some cases it's changed lives. I've had a few female members that have said, you know, I, would, I don't know what I would have done um, without Zoom. And what it's given them is a new skill to take forward and to talk to their families or to talk to their friends. But also since we started, I've heard people doing choirs, um, you know, book clubs and various other activities, which, which again, we're happy to facilitate. Lovely, because I think it's really important about connecting with communities at the moment, which is why we have this, this programme here um, and run lots of these events. Now, I'm going to um, start off not with a question, but with uh, a comment that's been anonymously posted that says, Kajaki, the most incredible film, I defy anyone to read the London Gazette citation for Mark with a dry eye. So I think that's just lovely that we start off um, remembering Mark. But your question, Andy, is from a um, retired Brigadier Fabricius of the Royal Army Medical Corps. I was privileged to hear Peter deliver the Vickery Lecture, uh, tying in uh, with the anniversary about double VC um, holders. And Noel uh, Chavas was one of those. And the Royal Army Medical Corps seems to monopolise that uh, particular point of double valour, which actually was why I asked you the question um, about medics in those situations as well. So, Peter's question. Andy, in the military, we do a lot by drills. There is a drill for almost everything and the automatic use of them is a key to military success. But drills cannot cover every situation. How best should we manage change from following the drill? And I think there's, again, it's just looking at the approach in, in, in a different way. You know, we have drills and skills for certain things, whether it's changing a magazine on a rifle um, or a machine gun or, you know, it's giving group references under fire and how we react. But I think when, when you're in the midst of, of you know, trauma, um, that goes out of the window. There are there are some decisions that need to be made without thinking um, and there aren't. But I think going forward with with the leadership side of life, I know I've worked quite quite intensely with um, General Ivan Jones, who is the current commander of the Field Army, and his his ethos and the way that he delivers his talks has been phenomenal, and it's been a privilege working with him. And I think he's the right man for the job at the moment. I think he's changing things within the military, whether it's healthy eating, um, the way that soldiers use their time. I think one of the worst ones in the drills and skills phase was weapon cleaning for me. You know, why did I need to clean a weapon? seven days a week when we could have been out there doing different things or on the back side of that looking at the time wasted which i know the empowerment team are doing now in the military um and you know if we can release soldiers on a weekend at thursday because there's nothing on a friday then do that keep the soldiers happy and then that way when they come to their training they're going to remember more skills and the drills that they've been taught because it's going to be current and they're going to enjoy doing it Whereas I think what what we don't look at in the military is the is the wasted time and how that can be managed. And I know that's slowly becoming more apparent in the in the next few years. And I do apologise. I, I missed off the end of that question. These are just showing up my IT skills, I'm afraid. A piece of question was also about individual leadership. And I did want to ask you about that, because even at a young age and at those relatively young uh, and junior ranks, Colleagues were finding themselves in a leadership role. Um, and obviously the military does train you um, for that. How important is it to recognise um, for these cadets, for example, coming in that there may well be situations where from almost day one, 
you are going to be a leader in some way? I think it's just it's just part of the process. You are going to be put, tested. You're going to be put in decisions, and sometimes you don't agree with people as well, which is fine. Um, but it's how you, you know it's how you approach that and um, mentor that person. And I think that's one of the big key skills that I've again that I've fought is actually listening to other people's opinions and. I kind of pick and choose from people and I've done it through talking for years. Um, so, you know, I, I enjoy people that present in a certain manner. I don't enjoy some presentations. If it's very PowerPoint scripted, it really doesn't doesn't interest me or make me tick. But I kind of steal things from people. So if I see something in a talk that I think, do you know what, that, manner, that mannerism works there or it doesn't. And I know Geraldine, I've talked to Owen Mitchell and you see the way I deliver is, is different to, to a lot of people. And that's kind of just taking things from people and learning them. And that's what comes onto the individual leadership you know we're all built with this desire unfortunately the military kind of squashes that from day one because we have a rank structure um, and as long as you can follow the chain of command that's fine but it's always worth looking around the corner and thinking well actually I don't disagree with what you're saying but how about this approach and if you slowly start to just put those little things into place and, and into somebody's ear then one day they're gonna you know they're gonna trust your judgment and it'll either be a success or a failure and again, as long as you can look at that failure, if it is, or the success and just analyse it and say, right, this is how it was successful. Again, what could we have done better to make it more successful? Or, you know, we failed, we're not going to do that again. Or how can we change it? And interesting in the next question is also about uh, leadership, junior leadership. Junior leaders in the army have always been well trained. Do you think that the army has changed its approach to that leadership training? And how do we maintain that given we're moving more into a peacetime period? I think junior, junior leaders are well trained. Um, it, it's really hard because I was I was put in a position where I had to um, I had to fight or flight and that was winning the George Medal. It might sound really strange but receiving the George Medal was one of the worst things and the best things that could have happened. And the worst scenario was I went from, you know, a private soldier A to private soldier A with a George Medal the next day. And suddenly you go from, you know, just being a normal soldier to you're having dinner with CGS. You're attending a cocktail party here. So I really had to turn my mannerisms around and the way that I portrayed myself, the way that I um, talked about. Um, other things with, with people, you know, I had to realise the company that I was in and kind of not not bluff my case, but, um, you know, change my views. And I remember having it, having a conversation at a cocktail party years ago and a senior officer who worked in Glasgow said, Andy, why have you not commissioned? I don't know, because that wasn't an option for me, you know, and, and again, and I think that's where a lot of our junior leaders struggle because sometimes their potential is not recognised. And I'm not saying that's a bad senior NCO or a bad officer. It's just a lot of people kind of fall under the radar when there's a little bit more opportunity. And again, there's only a certain amount of ranks, you know, that we can have at one time. There's only a certain amount of promotions and it's all going to be managed. Um, but I think, yeah, the junior leaders, it's more it's more knowing when to challenge a decision and why. And it's making sure that you can back it up. Good. Now, the next question is about something that um, we do a lot of work with uh, on Owen Mitchell. It's about the transition from military life to civilian life. This can be obviously a very demanding, disorientating process um, without injury uh, and obviously more so uh, with injury. So the question is, putting your injuries to one side, how did you find that transition? And what do you miss most about the military community? So sorry if you heard me laughing then. I was laughing at the, not at who's wrote the question, but at the question itself. And the reason is I have not transitioned. I work for a military charity. I work <laughs> around military people. I have 100% not transitioned from the army. Um, but in saying that, I do work for a civilian organisation. It's it's not as rank um, orientated. You know, it's all first name terms. Um, and I deal with soldiers and their families on a daily basis, no matter what rank. So. Yes, I've, tra I've transitioned into civilian life as in um, I work for, for a, a private organisation, but at the same time, my life evolves around soldiers. And for me, I just think that because of it, again, because of the George Medal, I can never leave. Um, I'm always invited to certain functions or or um, asked to, to, you know, do do this sort of thing or go and do talks at, at, for the military. 
Um, so for me, transitions are a really important key. It's one that I've worked closely with. Again, um, the the Commander Field Army just on how do you know when do we start transition? And I think one of my key points to the cadets out there that are listening and everybody else is, if you join the military, you start to transition on day one. Whereas the rest of us looked at it as well. I'll be out of the army next year. I'll do that in six months time. Probably not the best answer to give um, and it's definitely not the right one. So you've got to look at yourself as a career from day one and know that it's a two step career. And by two step career, I mean, yes, you may have four, eight, 12, 22 years in the forces or more if you're if you're even more successful, but you're always going to leave and it's making sure that you're prepared for when you leave and you know you don't need to know what you want to do from day one but it's just having that in the back of your head that one day i'm going to leave and i will need another career so the next question uh andy is did you get full support from your senior officers um for all the decisions that you made uh <laughs> whoever wrote that could they could they just elaborate a little bit more um yes i'm not sure whether that means in the uh minefield um or not so if whoever um wrote that question could um just clarify that um and then we'll do another one uh meanwhile before we go to the poll um and i think this is perhaps prompted by your um reference to uh commissioning we have i have to say um a lot of clients who um they may they may be injured and they may be medically discharged but their p files and uh their s jars etc show that they were candidates for late commissioning so um that's something that we're very familiar with where um people's uh um potential if you like is actually seen from from quite an early age but the question is do you think that background and um, that means class mm -hmm. uh, i can't say it ethnicity are more important than the army than ability ethnicity sorry apologies for that yes do you think background uh, gives you the edge rather than your ability no i don't think so um i think everybody's treated equally you know, I've worked with soldiers from various various backgrounds and I think what has changed, what I've seen change is, you know, I came from that council estate where with no qualifications, joined the army and it was you guaranteed to get in the infantry, that's it. Nowadays, I think people have to, um, you know, people need qualifications even to get in the forces at, at any level. Um, I think I think it's a case of if you're in the, if your face fits, sometimes it works. Um, <laughs> But no, I don't think anything's done on background. I think it is purely just ability, you know, it is ability led and yeah, the right place at the right time. And I have to say that the person who's uh, asked that question, Keith has now said, I'm interested because he's from Bolton too. So I don't think there's um, any, any issues arising out of Bolton as we've heard there. Andy, um, sometimes when we look back at decisions that were made, um, we have the benefit of hindsight um, and it's very difficult to ignore things that have happened and uh, since um, and hindsight's a, an absolutely uh, a fabulous tool uh, to to know what you know might have been um better um is that something that you've found um with regard to either you know the dam incident or or uh, anything else? Do you have to learn essentially to avoid hindsight? No, I think we. I think hindsight is part of everyday life. You know, we all think what would have happened. Um, I, I'm in a really strange one because I, I use Mark quite a lot, although he's not here. <laughs> it, it, again, it may sound strange, but when it comes to those difficult times, so around the incident date, um, I always have a little bit of a dip because. For me if mark wasn't where he was again i wouldn't be here and then around christmas and birthdays i really struggle with because i just think of mark again so that's why i've got the picture i know you can't see because my camera's not working but i've got a picture of him behind me um as we speak and it's quite strange i'll suddenly find myself in my hallway talking to mark and and although he doesn't reply um it just seems to be the right thing to do and that's kind of where i look at hindsight um but with regards to to everyday scenarios you know th there's always going to be that element of hindsight and that's what i'm saying as long as you can learn from 
that mistake or that uh, or where it failed. It's it's analysing it and looking at what could have been better, what could we have done differently, and how are we going to make it work in the future? Yeah, and and thank you to the person uh, putting the question about support and um, who's clarified that. And it's it's something I'm interested in as well because um, it's actually talking about. Um, the inquest which we know was two years later and it does link really nicely I think to this um, issue of, of hindsight so it's really whether you felt supported in the inquest you have to say yes Andy that you have the most marvellous legal team that helped you through that um, but of course it is two years later and there has been a board of inquiry and um, so it's really about do you think you got criticised for the decisions you and your colleagues or did you get uh, supported? And that could have been obviously superiors or it could have been the reporting of the inquest, the coroner, because you are in a witness box and you are cross-examined. No, um, I was supported fully. And I remember from day one, my CO and RSM um, literally said, look, mate, this is your life. Once you leave, you're a number. Um, you need to get what you can because that's that's going to prepare you for life in the future. So, yeah, I was definitely supported um, with, in and without. Obviously, the media um, do the usual media thing and either publish nice stories or not so nice stories. Um, and again, I think going through the inquest was was tough. One of the hardest things I've ever had to do because I, I've met Mark's mother, who just reminded me of Mark, and that was really hard. But it's nice that I've got a relationship still with Bob and Jen. Um, and I think it brought some closure as well because when you know the CO who was in charge of sending the, uh, the Chinook in at the time, who I've I've still contact today, literally put his hands up and said, "Look, I sent that Chinook because there was no other decision. I had nothing else to do." And we all looked at him and said, "You know what? We get it. He made that decision because it was the only decision he could make at the time. And would it have changed things? Possibly, but we don't know." No, thank, uh, thanks for that. It's, it's of interest to me because we do, I, I've often said that in the military work, we do a lot of our best work uh, in inquests and that's why we do do it for free because um, there are lawyers on the other side and we think that we should be there to help in some circumstances. Um, so I'm a real fan of the inquest process um, and as you say, it does provide often some closure and thanks for um yes i remember having the meal with bob and jem uh, beforehand and it's important that we remember them today so we have another question um from tamara uh, do you second guess your own decisions in your day-to-day -day life and has your military training helped you trusting your own choices trusting my own choices definitely um it, it's I have to put events on nowadays for you know every different scenario whether it's a wheelchair user or an amputee so I've kind of always got to be analyzing access into properties whether I'm putting on a lunch in Oxford for instance and I live in Portsmouth I've got to do my recce on that on the environment where I want to take people whether it's to a lunch or I want to take people sailing or skiing or wherever you know I always look at um, from a different point of view so I'll, I'll kind of have a tick list and go through it. But my choices wise, yeah, I'm pretty confident in, in the choices I'll make going forward. But I'm also happy to analyze and again, accept failure when it comes because it's it's apparent it will happen. Um, and I think that's one of the main key skills that we do learn in the military is if something goes wrong, we can go the other way, you know, and it's how we turn it, how we cope, um, how we debrief and then move forward. And I think that's one of the best things the military does is we're great at teamwork. We could be better at the communicating, but we are good. Um, but we are good at debriefing sometimes too much, but those debriefs can be key to move forward. And Andy, you've spoken a lot, haven't you, to commercial organisations. I know you've spoken around the world um, about your um, experience and, and I'm a great believer that lots of different organisations and individuals can learn from that kind of thing. And we've seen that very much with the delegates who um, wanted to and have joined uh, today. Um, how important to you is it to keep talking about things? I think it's hugely important because I, I, I always look back at uh, 
especially in the commercial world at what people are doing you know they might they're not doing the job that we signed up to do which can be life-changing you know my, my day in the office in the army was a little bit different to um a gp for instance going into their office however you know we look at the way the times have changed with the covid crisis it's flipped um you know the nhs is under so much pressure the decisions being made there are, are either right or wrong as well at government level but i won't i don't want to go into that side um yeah it's a hundred percent it's got to be focused on what you're doing at the time yeah and the talking wise it changes lives again as i said communication is the key and i think just for me from me talking about my story and my background where people think oh that's the worst day in the world actually i live my life quite comfortably now um you know i don't the mental side the mental health side of life is is fine i don't really get that that um stigma i i kind of you know live my life for my family and friends and, and that's it we, we live a normal life yeah um, i mean it's great that you've referenced the nhs there that's totally appropriate and actually in the Owen Mitchell tribute to the armed forces this weekend, um, we're paying tribute to them having helped, obviously, the NHS in lots of, of different uh, ways, whether it's by, you know, helicopter evacuation uh, or with the Nightingale um, uh, hospitals. So uh, there's definitely um, that link. Um, we have a, a, a comment um, and it is from someone who was closely uh, involved and who has said this uh, before, but the Board of Inquiry um, into Kajaki um, helped change things from the MOD's perspective. Um, and also it was something that you know, was of interest at political levels. So I think it's, it's always important that we um, learn from those Boards of Inquiries, now service inquiries, and I know that the MOD do take that um, on board and I know that's very important to everybody who was involved um, in it. So Andy, in terms of any final comment uh, in these interesting times? Yeah, I think I'll just um, go back to the comment that was made. Thanks for that. But having talked for the military for the last um, four or five years at various places, um, one, of, one of my one of my biggest talks was at Sandhurst for the CO and RSMs conference last year, and that was with Prince Harry, um, Rio Ferdinand and a few others, and it was great to share a stage with them. And the feedback after was phenomenal for me, um, and I got a lot more talks out of it for the military. I love going back to the military camps, whether it's, you know, tri-service and just engaging in their leadership days or normal days, just going in for a chat, um, because it kind of gives them, a, you know, it gives them a purpose, especially when in the times of peacetime because when it is in a, in a war type role, it's completely different. But going back to that comment, what, what was learnt that day seems to have portrayed Kajaki as one of the most modern day famous incidents. And I know there are so many more that went on, whether it was through Iraq um, or Afghanistan, and even, even the forgotten wars that we don't, you know, we forget the forgotten conflicts that I have the, pleasure of, listen, uh, the pressure, pleasure of listening to day to day by my members. Um, I think it has changed things, whether it's equipment, you know, what equipment we've got in theatre at the time, uh, the medical, Kazivac, you know, the Mert was formed and all this side of life uh, and it's all upgraded. I think, yeah, mistakes were made um, all across the board in that incident, but the outcome has been positive. And that's what, again, that's what I take away is, yes, I had to go through that experience for a lot of change to happen, not knowing it was going to happen or not knowing that incident was going to happen. But it's nice to actually see the positive outcomes that have happened and it's nice in some ways to be a part of that as well. I think that's an absolutely excellent place to end and a wonderful name dropping there uh, by uh, Andy. I could not possibly uh, top that. Um, thank you to everyone who's put questions and we've had some really nice comments as well about the session as we come to an end. So I'm really grateful uh, for that. Um, I would refer you to the Owen Mitchell website hub. There are these talks going on more than one every week. There is something for everybody uh, in that. Um, and uh, there's also legal and financial help, but there's lots of really um, interesting talks. So please, if this is your first talk or your 10th talk, please do look at that um, and register. And also, if you want to give us ideas about something that you would like to have a talk about, we will do our best uh, to arrange it. There will be a feedback 
um, survey and if you could um, complete that we would be very grateful so that we can uh, learn from next time. Um, but most of all, I'd just like to say um, thanks to the events team who organised this and thanks to Andy um, as ever. Um, it's been absolutely great to hear him again and every time I listen to him, I'll, I'll learn something new, a different aspect to take away. Um, I'd like to wish you all a happy Armed Forces Day uh, on Saturday and and uh, uh, if you toast that or celebrate it in however you would like to do that. Um, and thank you for joining. Goodbye.